Hi, this is Roy Oppenheim. We are here for a special Zoom at noon. Uh, this is either our 29th or 30th Zoom at noon. We took a break and we'll continue to do special editions uh, uh, as warranted. Obviously, uh, there's been a lot that has happened in the past few weeks that we want to kind of summarize and discuss what that means for uh, the rest of the year and the new year, particularly in terms of the election and, of course, uh, uh, the, the vaccine and uh, the implications of, of all of that and, and many other things. I want to uh, let you all know that Ken Morris, my dear friend of many years, a, a, a prominent uh, realtor in the, in the community, uh, a president of uh, Morris Southeast Group, uh, by popular request is, is joining us today. Ken, are you there? I want you to pop in and say hi. There he is. Hi, Ken. Okay, put your-, put your I'm screen. here. There you are. Great. Hello, Great. everybody. How are you doing? Good to be here. Thank you. Well, let's keep going. Um, I want to, of course, as usual, thank my wife and my law partner, Ellen Polelski, and Jeff Sherman, my partner, and Lance Oppenheim, who's been assisting us today, and uh, our new associate, Jared Burfond, who uh, has also been helpful in, in preparing this, this all for us today. Uh, next slide, if we can. Zoom at noon, now what? Well, there's, there's a, a lot going on, obviously. Um, the election, while it was disruptive, uh, the stock market and other markets have recognized that, that there is some uh, normalcy uh, at the back end of this. Uh, with the vaccine now uh, creating the opportunity for a, a light at the end of the tunnel, there, there's, there are many changes that are now going on in the, in the, in the economy. In terms of the election, we're going to talk about uh, if, in fact, the Senate uh, remains in Republican hands or if, in fact, uh, it does switch over, which won't occur uh, till uh, the runoff in January in Georgia, we'll know that. But in the meantime, we, we can start to read some tea leaves in terms of, of what a Biden administration is, is going to look like. Uh, as you all know, uh, our firm was founded almost 31 years ago by, by Ellen, my, my wife and partner. Uh, we serve both local, national, and international clients. And uh, we were uh, in the trenches during the last economic crisis and during this crisis, uh, We've been kind of a shepherd, a steward of some sort, uh, trying to get us all through this together. And, and the idea that there is now light at the end of the tunnel is uh, very promising for us personally, as, as well as uh, for all of us, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, one new thing I wanna tell everyone about is, is that during this pandemic, we recognized that we could actually have a broader reach than just our Western office. And so we have established four additional office, actually three additional offices, one in Boca, Palm Beach, uh, an additional one, Fort Lauderdale and, and Miami. Uh, that is one to, uh, that is four offices in addition to, to Weston. They're all virtual offices. And at the same time, uh, there is a, that is a place where we can meet clients uh, under, under proper social distancing conditions and when the pandemic's over, and at the same time, uh, serve a broader uh, community than, than, than just merely uh, the Weston area. Uh, we want to, let's go to the pandemic update and, and there is a, a lot to talk about. First of all, on the bright side, we're seeing that uh, there is a promise of a vaccine that is uh, at least 90%, it could be much more than 90% effective. Of, co of course, it has to be FDA approved. And uh, Kenny, you there, I wanna, wanna see uh, if, uh, if you wanna chime in here because uh, you do have some, some particular knowledge through, through your family. Are you there? Can you uh, chime in? How do I chime Ken in? Uh, Ken, you there? What am I? I'm here. Oh, there you are. There you are. Okay. I'm just impatient. I'm sorry. So I just want to talk about briefly about the vaccine and how it's going to get delivered because you were telling me about, you know, that, that the delivery is going to be a real issue. Yeah. I mean, the delivery is going to be really an issue. And I think we all have to manage our expectations. I mean, first things first, the Pfizer vaccine sounds great, but it needs to be kept at 100 degrees below zero in order for it to be stored effectively. Many, many uh, places do not have that kind of storage. kinks out. Great news, but we're still talking about the same timeline we were, you and I, months and months ago, where it's probably going to be summer, fall before a lot of people are going to start getting the injections. Remember, it's a two-injection, uh, two-dosing uh, uh, vaccine. So you've got to get the people to show up and get the first one and then come back and get the second one follow-up. It's really important for us to, to, to note that. 
31 days apart, and we also don't know what its impact is going to be on children, babies, and of course the elderly. So there are a lot of, lot of issues. But the fact is that we have light at the end of the tunnel and we have hope, which is, uh, you know, springs eternal. And so for us, that, that is, is very important. On the flip sure. side of that, we, we look at, at this image uh, of Notre Dame uh, versus Clemson and, and everyone storming the field afterwards. And, and there's just been ubiquitous, ubiquitous incrimination here about what people were thinking and doing uh, in, in this particular moment, uh, creating super spreader events. And the same, of course, occurs with people on the streets after, after the election. I mean, these are all gonna be super spreader events post you know, Thanksgiving, when, when the kids come home for, for Thanksgiving, uh, what are they gonna bring home from these kinds of uh, situations? You know, at 111,000 new cases a day, uh, the CDC is now talking about 200,000 new cases a day by, by Christmas or, or New Year's. And so uh, pandemic uh, or vaccine or not, we're, we're still probably going to go through some very dark moments here before we, we, we make the final curve. If you, you concur with that? Ken? Yeah, you bet. Yeah, unfortunately. I mean, here we have the numbers. If we take a look, we're seeing over 10 million reported cases, 238,000 deaths. Uh, just in the past day, 100, actually, it says 103, it's really 111,464 deaths. What's interesting, and maybe we can't read too much into this, is that if we, if we look at the 10 million over the 234,000 deaths, we're seeing you know, a 2.4% death rate. But on, if we look at the 464 over the 103,000, it's, it's, it's less than half a percent. So I'm not sure if that means anything or if it means that, that uh, the type of, of that, uh, uh, virus that people are now getting is, is not as deadly or that we have developed new mechanisms, new, new ways of, of handling it. And, and, and it's premature to say that, but it's, it's a big spread if you look at the statistical a difference be between the two. Um, um, in addition, if we take a look at, at where the spread is, we're seeing the spread is really now in the Midwest where it previously wasn't. It's not in New York, it's not in Florida, it's not in California. And these are uh, parts of the state, uh, parts of the country that, that really were reluctant at some points to, to wear a mask. And so we're seeing uh, politically as, as well as uh, evidentiary wise that, that um, you know, probably people need to take the social distancing and CDC requirements a little, a little more, more seriously. Uh, any thoughts on that before we move on? Well, I think science actually uh, is the is the the word of the day, and uh, you you can't fight against uh, the tide of science. And the bottom line is is the anti-vaxxing mentality that has proliferated over the last decade or so is really going to hurt us as far as getting the vaccine out, getting people to be willing to take it and solving this problem. And uh, that uh, speaks to a larger societal issue that is beyond my, uh, my franchise, unfortunately. But I mean, you know, the average flu vaccine is only 50 or 60%, sometimes only 40% effective. So if we got a vaccine that's truly 80 or 90% effective, even if you have to take it a few times, that would go a very long way in, in changing the mindset and, and getting this economy back opened up. And I think that's why we're seeing this, this rotation in the stock market right now of, of uh, types of stocks that people would be stay at home stocks versus op opening up economy stocks, cruise lines, airlines, restaurants versus, uh, you know, the Zoom uh, type stocks that, that, that people were, were previously, uh, you know, focusing on. So it's going to be very interesting to see if it's premature or, or if in fact it's telling of, where, of where, where we're going to be going. I want to mention to everyone that if you have any questions or comments, whether you vehemently disagree with something we're saying or want to add something or have a question, we, we invite you to, to just type in a question and we, we will get to it. We are gonna go an extra 10 minutes today so we can get to everyone's questions and uh, let us proceed. Uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about the economy. Uh, the, the economy was already laden with debt before COVID. Now uh, the bad news, uh, and that's bad news for the recovery because this situation uh, means that there's gonna be even more debt. And we're gonna go through that right now so we can see what kind of debt we're talking about. If we look at the upper left, uh, growth of, of government business household debt and, and unfunded pension obligations, just a straight line up. Uh, we have here in terms of the recession on the right, we're seeing uh, US debt to GDP, again, a hockey stick straight up. And then if we go to debt, um, excuse me, uh, debt growth by sector, we're seeing the federal government debt's gone way up. State, state and government debt hasn't gone that bad. And then household and nonprofit organizations haven't gone that bad because many of the households were, were buoyed up by, by uh, various government pro you know, programs and, and moratoria. Uh, but when that changes, uh, then everything everything changes. And this federal government uh, indicator is regardless of who's president, you're going to have to pay that down and at least get that line back, 
back on track. And the only way that's going to happen is by growing the economy and in some cases increasing certain tax rates. And so that's just an inevitable consequence of, of all these government programs. But what's interesting is in terms of consumer non-housing debt, so this does not include, include mortgage debt, and we'll talk about mortgage debt. The biggest amount of debt and that the biggest problem right now is probably student debt, uh, then credit card debt and auto debt. And we're seeing uh, that uh, certainly the Biden administration is talking about some sort of forgiveness program for student debt. And we're seeing big companies, even like Google, who are now matching uh, down uh, uh, grants to uh, their employees who pay down their debt, and they're actually matching dollar for dollar up to a certain dollar amount. And we're going to see more of that in the private sector, I believe, in the, in the, in the years to come. Uh, and then we go down here to consumer debt, the bottom left, non-housing debt and housing debt. We're seeing housing debt that is shooting up, but non-housing debt has come down. So credit card debt's coming down because people have been spending less money, they've been going out less and staying home more. But the housing debt continues to increase because with the moratoria, uh, the debt isn't going down, it's just not being paid. And this is a something that can, you know, we're gonna talk about a little bit uh, further in, the, in this program today. And then percentage of loan balance, 90 days past due by type. Credit card debt, as we're seeing, uh, is, is actually going up. Student loan debt, uh, looks like it's actually coming down in interesting percentage of loan balances. Uh, and then auto debt is, is, is going up. Um, and then the federal deficit, we're seeing again, this, this upside down hockey stick, it's, uh, something that's just going to have, we're all just going to have to address and, and we can't put our head in the sand on this one forever. Uh, the pandemic depression is over now the pandemic recession has begun. So yeah, I, there's no question that for a period of a few weeks, a few months, we were absolutely in a depression, both mentally, economically and emotionally. And while now it's more of an economic recession, uh, we're going to be dealing with that probably for an extended period of time. And, and this is a great, a great slide right here. Pan pandemic jo job losses are worse than the past recession. So if we go to 2008, we actually see this blue line uh, as the number of, uh, of how long it took for, uh, uh, for there to be a recovery, uh, even excluding directly affected sectors. So this is a percent. So we're at about 7% and it took around 15 months here. We, we were at job losses at 14% overall. And if we excluded um, certain uh, industries that were directly affected uh, by uh, the pandemic, such as uh, the cruise line industry or airline industry, that would be the differential. But this is the true number. So let's compare that. That number still hasn't gotten back to where 2008 is. If we exclude those that are affected, we're almost back at, at how bad uh, it was in, in 2008. But in terms of the number of months after the peak, it could take quite some time uh, for, uh, for us to fully recover. And so that's going to be the issue of what this recovery is going to look like and who this recovery is going to benefit in some ways. Um, how the job losses compare to 2008 and 2020, it's kind of interesting. Uh, temporary help services in 2008, 31% loss, this time only 16, printing 15 to 12. I think if we go down, we look at some real interesting ones. Real estate, we're seeing that last time it, it, it impacted the, that sector by 5%, and this time it's only impacting the, that sector by 3%. And the reason for that is that there's a lot of activity that's going on that Ken and I are gonna talk about in, in a few minutes. But as we can see, it hasn't been as, as severe. Uh, office physicians, much worse. Two, uh, the last time it went up 2%, this time it went down 3%. Uh, and telecommunications, minus six, minus three, counting bookkeeping. So, so there, there, there are certain anomalies here that are very interesting and you're welcome to study this further later. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Share of unemployed who've been out of work for 27 weeks or longer. In the last recession, uh, the number, uh, it was about 40% uh, were out for 27 weeks or longer at, 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 after the recession. Here we're at 32.5 already, which is, which is quite, quite high and it may, it may continue to grow. That's the number of people who've been out of work for 27 weeks or longer. Um, okay, so this is kind of interesting. So, People have been spending their money on food in the past, um, 45 to 50% of one's food budget was spent on going out to eat. And now it's, it's around 20 or 25% that may include delivery. And the question is post pandemic, how that will turn. Around 25 or 30% of, of all restaurants uh, are, are now not operating. And the question is how many of them will continue not to operate once the, the smoke clears. And, and they may just get replaced by new folks and there may just be a natural, uh, change of, of guard of who runs these restaurants, but it's gonna be a question to see, to see what happens. Um, 
Next slide is who moves into the cities. And this is kind of interesting because it has to do with the population shift as well as what's going on in real estate. What we're seeing is that, that obviously younger people like to move into cities and as they get older here, as they, as they get older at the bottom here, we're seeing that less and less uh, people move into the cities. And, and, this, and this is for people who are college educated and usually find that, that there's a career advantage to move into a big city. For those that have less education, uh, that, that paradigm does not really occur and it actually stays pretty flat. And as they get older, they start to move too, but it isn't as a radical move. And why this is so interesting is if people don't move to the cities in the first place, then they won't move out and you won't have that transition. Right now you're having people moving out of the cities who are much younger than they ordinarily are. And so this entire sh uh, line would be shifting probably to the left somewhat. And that will have a major impact on suburban markets, uh, uh, rural markets, as, as well as uh, uh, the moving industry, I guess, in general. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the Paycheck Protection Program. That's what, what has kept the small business in check and what's, what's kept the economy to the extent possible uh, thriving to a large extent. And here we have uh, a lot of folks who are trying to figure out when they should submit and, re and repay or, or, or move for, for forgiveness on the loan. And it's kind of interesting because the banks keep sending letters out to, to, to our clients saying, uh, you can pay now, you don't have to pay now, we're waiting to hear from the government if there's gonna be another, uh, another stimulus. And in the next stimulus, regardless if it's a Democrats or Republicans, we anticipate that there will be uh, a very simple application for folks who borrowed less than $150,000. Right now, if you borrowed less than 50, it's a one page affidavit. Uh, if above that, there's a simple form, but they wanna make that form almost the same like for the folks who borrowed less than 50,000. And the reason for that is that the banks cannot, don't have the resources, don't have the funds, don't have the time, don't have the manpower to actually go through each application with a fine tooth comb. And so they're, they're looking to, to try and have folks uh, make some sort of statement under oath that they have followed the, the program. Having said that, it looks like that the uh, Democratic platform is talking about a more vigilant uh, approach to the fraudsters and people who took an undue advantage of the program and to go after uh, folks who, uh, who abused the program. So in terms of Paycheck Protection Program, we're going to see what happens in the lame duck Congress. It's possible that, that, that some sort of stimulus program will will come through or we will just have to wait for the new Congress in, in January. Again, we talked about the impact of the program and, and, and what its impact is, is going to be. Uh, without a new stimulus program, probably more small businesses will close. And then the question will be, will they be replaced by other small businesses or, or what will happen to them? What, what do you think, Ken, especially in terms of strip malls? Uh, I, I think that small retail has is, is been under attack for many, many years. And I think uh, for many of them, this was the final nail. Uh, you're not going to see many of these entrepreneurs be able to pull it back together. Uh, a lot of them were long time bootstrapping, you know, hardworking entrepreneurs. The market that they serve is no longer there, uh, especially in some of the, the dense urban cores. Right now, it's going to take a long time for people to start coming back to to, to work and where they and have the employee base that they were serving, it's not going to happen for a while. Still, even with good news related to a vaccine, it's interesting because the last time there was a Democratic administration during the economic crisis, there wasn't a real focus on small business. And hopefully, this time they will recognize that that was a mistake and that there should have been a focus on small business as opposed to pandering to the large banks early on and and trying to keep them solvent not worrying about what impact uh, the, the, the Great Recession was having on Main Street. Well, and so it would be interesting. Well, I, I think Main Street is who, who employs America. And I think the average person doesn't realize how small the amount of public traded companies there are in the United States. You know, the S&P, the Dow, uh, you know, all the public markets are a very small, you know, amount of, of enterprise. Yes, generally they're very large, but they don't employ the balance of most Americans. And more money definitely needs to be given or, or programs need to be focused on small business. That's how we're gonna get this country moving forward. Entrepreneurialism is what America was founded on. And uh, if you ignore it, you're not gonna, you're, you're, never, you're still gonna be going in a circle. Right. I mean, there used to be something called the American Stock Exchange. I don't know if it exists anymore, but there are many less companies that are public today than there were before, which suggests that that small business and medium-sized businesses employ still a much larger sector of, 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 any, of the economy than, than large public companies. And so the, the focus has to be, you know, at least equal to focusing on, on them. And, and hopefully uh, this, this new administration will, will, will get that right. So we will see. Um, 
In terms of moratorium expirations and impact on foreclosures, it, the likelihood is that, that many of these moratoriums will not be extended very long, uh, and, and as particularly the foreclosure, one, the ones on mortgages, uh, and, and that's going to create some havoc, and, and we're going to discuss where that havoc is going to be in, in, in just a moment and who that's going to impact. Um, I forgot what movie this is, but uh, this is some guy who self-foreclosed himself and he ejected himself. I forgot what, what was going on here. But in any event, we are going to see an increase in foreclosures. Everyone's talking about it. It's not going to happen this year. It's not going to happen probably in the first 30 or 60 days of January, but by the first or second quarter, we are going to see an uptick in, in, in foreclosures. What, what's your sense on, on that, Ken? Absolutely. Um, you know, and I feel for everyone that's affected economically by, you know, the pandemic, but we don't really have a choice. Um, you know, the, the very nature and fabric of, of our economy is based on the sanctity of contracts and you can't allow people to stay in apartments indefinitely and not pay rent. It just doesn't work. And ultimately a contract does have to be a contract. I think the government does need to step in and assist small landlords and assist tenants that are struggling to figure out what they can do as well as borrowers. There has to be something that, that the government is really the only solution to it. But at the end of the day, you cannot stop, you cannot have an indefinite moratorium on foreclosures or uh, evictions because otherwise the whole system collapse. No, I, and and that's right. we can't have it. And what's interesting is a lot of small mom and pop uh, real estate owners who have been renting properties out would prefer to go to an air and B and B kind of model because they don't have the problem of moratoria and not collecting. They get paid up front. People don't leave. They can kick the people out. They're under a different set of rules and regulations. Uh, and they don't have to worry about all of a sudden not collecting rent and having someone be able to squat and stay in their home for weeks, months, almost a year soon. And, and that's a risk that some people just, just can't afford. I mean, a large institution may be able to handle that, but, but a lot of your, your, your rental base is, is, is mom and pops and they still have to pay that mortgage. And so we're gonna have this negative ripple effect if we don't balance those, those issues very, very carefully. At the same time, you know, we've been defending people in foreclosures for years. We're gonna to continue to do that. And we expect to be very busy uh, once again in, in defending uh, homeowners, particularly homeowners who were illegally foreclosed upon, which is what happened last time. And uh, we, we hope that um, that doesn't happen, but, but we, we anticipate it will happen. And, and we'll talk about a second where, where it will happen. So right here, if we go right here, 6.5 uh, million uh, new sales of existing homes have occurred. Uh, that's up 21% from a year earlier. So there's a lot of new activity. And because there's new activity, a lot of people actually do have equity in, in their homes. There's only a small percentage, and we'll go to that slide in a second, of people who don't have equity in their home. But it's the folks who don't have equity in the homes that are going to be the most likely who are going to be foreclosed first. And that is clearly uh, at the not the high end of the market or the medium end, but it's going to be that lower end of the market. Usually it's the people who've been working the hardest. It's the folks who've been at the front lines and they're people who really should, should receive some sort of a bailout and in all likelihood probably will not. And so that's where you're going to have the real hurt. What do you think? Ken? Yeah, I'm looking at some of the questions. Um, okay. There's, there's some great questions. I didn't see it, all tied, it, all, it all ties to it. You know, where's the money going to come from? Uh, is the government going to keep the interest rates low? Um, the answer is yes, and, and I don't know. Um, I, I think interest rates are going to be kept low, whether we like it or not. Unfortunately, that means, you know, pensioners and, and retirees are going to be eating cat food forevermore because they're not getting the yield on, on, on their, fixed in, their fixed assets. It's just, that's the nature of, of, of our reality. And the government's not going to have the ability to stop borrowing at any time soon. So the federal deficit's going to get worse. But if we keep the interest rates super low, at least paying back what we can pay back at the federal level will be less expensive. Unfortunately, if we start to raise interest rates, it has a domino effect throughout the entire real estate market in all asset prices. So I think right now there's a floor underneath, at least in my world, which is real estate, commercial real estate, there's a floor artificially perhaps because of low interest rates. And I think until we get to a more, whatever normal is, and this is not normal folks, you know, you're not going to see an interest rate increase anytime soon. Even if the Fed is more concerned about deflation 
because that's even scarier than inflation. And deflation is still a real risk out there because there's literally hundreds of billions of dollars, trillions of dollars in negative yielding assets globally. In fact, people that are using foreign money to buy our treasuries right now are getting negative yields. So interesting times indeed. I hope that answered some questions. Yeah, yeah, I think we kind of answered all three questions at the same time. I mean, uh, the government is at some point going to need to figure out how to get more revenue and they have to do it in a way that's fair and that, that people are going to be willing to ex accept. But in the meantime, the Federal Reserve just said the other day that they're planning on keeping interest rates as low as possible for as long as possible. Uh, let's move on here because we're going to keep going. Uh, status of coronavirus forbearance. This is very important. I mean, we're looking here still in forbearance, 3 million people. If we go down here, still in forbearance, uh, that's another million. And then delinquent after forbearance, that's a half million. So that's looking 3 million, 4 million, you're talking about four and a half million people that are uh, way behind, maybe close to six months or a year behind that probably will not be able to catch up. And when they are asked to start paying their mortgage or to catch up, many of those people will end up going into foreclosure if it, they're, they're at the lower end and they don't have enough equity in their homes. And here's the slide I was talking about, percentage of mortgage US homes worth less than their debt quarterly. We can see uh, the number has gone way down from 2010 where, where a quarter of the people were underwater and slowly but surely as prices have gone up and they've gone up because of, of the virus in many, in many markets this year, uh, only about less than 5% don't have equity. So many people will not do short sales. A lot of realtors are, are getting ready to do short sales it's not gonna be short sales. They're, they're going to be maybe distressed sales, but it's not gonna be a short sale where you have to go to the lender and ask them uh, for to take a haircut. I mean, maybe there'll be just enough to pay the commissions. Maybe the commissions will have to be you know, reduced slightly, but people are basically gonna basically come out of this hole for the most part. But with uh, you know some people who are underwater right here, they won't. But these folks here, if they decide that they're in forbearance and don't wanna get out, they can get out. And then what they're gonna do is they're gonna rent a home in a similar community from one of the large publicly traded or private equity firms that now own tens of thousands. And we, and we did a whole Zoom at Zoom noon. Ken, you were, you were part of one of these, I think, talking about the idea that people are going to be renting their home, not, not that particular home, but a home in general that has been designed with enough amenities for uh, the, the new era, which will include working nooks and other kinds of environments for, for larger families uh, and larger square footage than, than, than typical rental apartments used to have. And so we're going to see the American dream no longer be owned, but to a large extent, that American dream can be rented and can be rented quickly. People stay an average of a three to five years in these homes and then they move on. Uh, and so it's going to be interesting. And then also with the work from anywhere phenomenon, it's not just work at home anymore. It's work from anywhere. I mean, that's what's so remarkable. Work from home was, was initially the, the idea, but now it's work from anywhere. And that's why farmhouses in Kansas and Nebraska are, are so busy with, with Airbnb because people are saying, oh, I might as well work at a farmhouse in the middle of, of, of Kansas and Nebraska. And people have moved to Colorado and Utah and Wyoming and Montana. And of course, down to Florida and down to the Keys. You can work anywhere. So um, it's- it's, yeah, it's as, long, as long as there's bandwidth, you can work anywhere. And I think with the new 5G network rolling out, uh, and it's going to take time because 5G requires uh, more antennas being installed in a very specific area. But that wave is coming. And as long as the bandwidth, the high bandwidth is ubiquitous in all of those areas, you will see the work from anywhere uh, continue. And I, I think that'll accelerate. It's not going to slow down. Right. So, even, so with the, even with the vaccine. So, so even you know, before the economic crisis, there was a work from home phenomenon that was, was starting. And then, of course, it, it, it just blew off the handle. And then work from home became work from anywhere. And now the question is what the tax code is going to change. There's going to have to be lots of fundamental institutional changes to accommodate that. I was looking at, at a, a major law firm that had a major office that they had just built out in, uh, in, in Hudson Yards in New York. And they just announced today, I won't mention the name, that they are reevaluating the need for having high priced, expensive offices that are not being used when you can have a work from anywhere environment. And, and frankly, people like the work from anywhere. They can pick up and move and go where they want and still get their work done, just like we're all doing right now. Probably 90% of us are working from home. Maybe not you, Ken, but certainly uh, most of us are. Uh, and and it's, it's an opportunity. Even if you want to go to the office, you go to the office, but you don't need that, that, that super view that no one's going to look at anymore. I mean, it's just going to be a change in mindset, a fundamental change. And Ken, let's talk about that impact on the, on the uh, office market. Yeah, um, I think that... Um you know, the genie is out of the bottle and you're not gonna stuff it back in. 
Uh, I debate with my colleagues on a regular basis of the changing office environment. I don't think the office is going to disappear. It's not going to disappear, but I think the the average enterprise's footprint will shrink. And there is a whole percentage of the workforce that loves working from anywhere, loves working from home, doesn't feel the need to come in on a regular basis, except when it's you know, absolutely necessary. With that said, there is a percentage of the work, workforce that are social creatures. They have to be in a shared work environment. And you know, enterprise will make adjustments for that. Moving forward though, you know, in my opinion, working in the business for the last 31 years, the most important, important, you know, value for all enterprise, when you talk about, uh, you know, what the shared values for an enterprise, it's really the bottom line. And if you're the one stroking the check every month or you're the CFO of that company, and you know that you can save 20 to 30 or 40 percent of your occupancy costs. Ultimately, you're going to go in that direction whether you want to or not. And, you know, I, I know there's a lot of talk about, well, how can you have team cohesiveness and how can you, you know, you have a shared vision when people aren't working together. I'm telling you, it's our nature as human beings to be adaptable and it's already adapting now. I have a tenant just down the down the, the way in my park where I manage where my office is, 60% of his people are never going to come back. Even with the vaccine, it doesn't matter. 60% of them are just not going to come back. And that's that's just going through the marketplace. Whether it's 60 or 30, it's going to be something sizable. And I think the office market from the uh, fundamental level is there's going to be a paradigm shift. That's a tw my 25 cent phrase of the day. And I think that smaller footprints, shorter term leases are going to be the norm, which means that affects the financing of office buildings with shorter term loans, less money thrown into tenant improvements. There's a lot of things that are going to change. It's really early in the ball game to know exactly to what extent, but change is definitely the name of the game. And anybody that thinks otherwise, I think is holding on to, you know, wishful thinking. So, so two points. One is, you know, a lot of businesses and companies talk about their culture. And the question is, how do you maintain a culture from a work from home, work from anywhere? Unless the culture becomes work from home, work from anywhere. And that becomes a new culture that you can go anywhere, be anywhere, and still be part of this organization. So the culture has to evolve. And so say, oh, we, this is not our culture. No, it's a new culture. And you have to embrace that new culture. And so the company has to embrace the culture versus the people having to embrace a pre-existing culture. And so the question is, uh, will that work? And will leadership in organizations understand that? Uh, in our case, we shed like, like a chameleon and, and just reinvented ourselves. More offices, less office, people working from home, working from anywhere, and, and, and we're thriving. We're, we're thriving. And, and uh, you know, but it it's wasn't- going, It's gonna change even more. And I'll tell you why. I spent about an hour last night with an Oculus rig on my head and going through various software packages, which are virtual meeting, basically you, you're able, if from a cultural standpoint, you're able to have a meeting, you know, with all of your peers, basically look at them, you know, it's an avatar, but a pretty good avatar and it takes a picture. This is just first generation technology. Very soon you're gonna basically, before you turn, you, you put on your, your glasses, you know, you'll get scanned with an IR or a laser or something and then you drop in into, into this virtual environment. And I, again, the cost of operating an office, especially one with a beautiful view of Biscayne Bay or, or, or the Harbor, Hudson Yards, whatever, you, you know, at the end of the day, you have to say, what's the ROI for that enterprise? And I think that the new model will be employees rotating in and out, but very few staying all the time inside a fixed work workspace and, and, and not to be you know gloom and doom but this pandemic may not be a 100 year event it was a hundred years since the last event but the experts are saying this could become a 10-year event yes. and that every 10 or 20 years we're going to be dealing with this and why are we going to be dealing with this we're going to be dealing with this because the earth is heating up 
people are invading locations that used to belong to the animals and used to belong to the forest and we're deforesting and we're expanding and the two shall not meet and they have met. And once they meet, you don't know what you're going to uh, spawn from that. And so the question is, if, you're, if that is the new reality, why would you do a 10 or 15 year lease? You, you're either do a three year lease. So you have the ability to be nimble and do whatever you have to do to continue to exist I mean, the beautiful thing here we've seen is, A, we see how robust our democracy is. We got through this election. It was doom and gloom. The stock market's going crazy. They think things are stable. Yeah, we still have some issues on the outside. Who really won and whatever. But we're moving forward. The country is moving forward. We got a vaccine that the sun shined the next day and we're, and we're, and we're progressing. But, but at the same time, uh, we can say, look how the world has, has reacted. Yes, we've had a lot of deaths. Yes, we've had a lot of exposure. But at the same time, society and humanity is continuing. Babies are being born. In our case, we had a, we had a grandchild. That's why we stopped some of these Zooms at noon so we could, we could actually enjoy the special moment of, of our grandchild being, being in our home for the first few months. I mean, who would ever have expected that? I mean, it's just a, such a silver lining. And so we're seeing so much of, of how we as humans can, can adapt and evolve. And so with that, we're gonna see changes to how we do business. And so one of them, as you say, Ken, is people don't wanna you know, enter into five, 10-year leases anymore. They're just not gonna do it. Just not going to do it. Uh, let's talk right. about. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. And then I want to talk about. I was just going to say because they, 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 most people can't forecast out six months, much less 18 months in their business. Um, you know, a few have ongoing contracts that are they, they believe they've got a revenue stream for a certain amount of time, but most of the the office leases that I'm involved with now are, are pretty much three years or under. And I think that is going to, to require a fundamental study of the way that office product is financed and how tenant improvements are dealt with. In the old days, the old model was, I was representing law firm A that wanted to sign a, a seven to 10 year deal and they got a 50 or $60 a square foot tenant improvement allowance package that could be underwritten by the landlord because it had a long enough runway to amortize the cost of those improvements. Right. That is not going to happen moving forward unless the tenant is willing to spend its own money in someone else's real estate, which rarely happens. And I think that offices themselves are going to get more standardized and you'll see basically, you're gonna do a three-year deal or less, this is what you get. If you wanna have any modifications, it's gonna be on your dime. So that itself is gonna be another big change in in what office in how the office building ownership business will be run and you know some buildings are functionally obsolescent the cost to bring them into the 21st century is probably so high that either there's got to be either an adaptive reuse for those structures or you just demo them. you just hit the plunger and and that land gets turned into something else so Ken, I've been flashing some pictures of some uh, decrepit malls around the country. Uh, maybe it's a little too Darwinian, but but I wanted to uh, get your your sense on uh, what you think these spaces will be converted into. Yeah, I'm just I'm waiting for the the vampires or the zombies to creep out from behind in the dark spaces and and come run towards uh, the camera. Um, yeah, I think that um, the the enclosed large regional mall model for the most part is is pretty dead. I think you're going to see a lot of those structures either demolished or repurposed. You and I have talked about in the past. I mean, I, I'm sometimes way out there. And I think like, like let's say the Broward Mall, which is a big mall here in central Broward County, it, it's not doing very well. It's in special receivership already. In theory, that structure, if it was bought at the right number, could be turned into a grow facility for you know you name it from cannabis to vegetables to fish farming etc you're going to see some of those big malls those structures change into things like that or they'll be scraped or converted to something else but the cost of conversion to other uses has to make sense ultimately whatever your basis is in buying the land and the structure you have to look at what your capital expenditures are to make sure it makes sense that it'll pencil out for whatever the adaptive reuse is downstream. So, 
I, I just want to say, when you think about the number of malls within like a five mile, six mile radius between the Sawgrass, Broward Mall, the Fashion Mall, the Galleria, and then uh, the well, Mall in Pembroke Pines, and then maybe even if you want to throw in uh, Aventura, I mean, they're all, they're all within 10 miles of each other, each one. Well, the Fashion Mall is gone now. I mean, I understand. It, it, Obviously, I was the first to go. Right. And that, and that, it was the first to go, and that's, that, that, that basically was really the signal uh, that the world has changed. And the big box retailers are gone. You know, they're all filed, you know, chapter 11. They're generally, many of them are not going to ever come back. The way we go and shop, the way we, we do things, it's, it's, you know, I blame a lot of it on Amazon and the Amazon effect. When you, you know, say the big box retailer, I mean, you got Walmart, you got Costco, you got Target, you got Home Depot, you got Lowe's, you got Best Buy. Those big box retailers are, are, are doing fine, and they're actually going to do do quite well post post pandemic, and they're doing fine now. Yeah, I, I I'd say maybe department stores, maybe is yeah, what I was yeah. thinking in my head. I think they're done; um, they're not coming back. And uh, you know, I, I think uh, you know, there's a lot of real estate that's going to sit you know, lie fallow for some time until it works its way through the system. And, you know, real estate pricing is very sticky on the way down. And usually it takes a long time for someone to finally throw in the towel and say, I'll take five cents on the dollar for this to get it off our books. We're not at that point yet, but we'll get there for certain asset classes. Right. I, 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 it, Lance found this this uh, chart, and it's really an, a very important chart because it, it, it speaks for for so many other things. Talking about the number of fires on the West Coast this year, if we see, if we just look at the red line, it just dwarfs literally everything that we've previously existed. And that's the same case here in terms of the number of named storms that we've had in South Florida. The flooding yesterday. I mean, I've been here 30 years. The flooding we we personally ex received yesterday was something that that we were not really personally familiar with inland as far as it was. And and uh, I'm hearing anecdotally that, that people are saying that time they I've never seen anything like this, never seen anything like this. And now there's another storm as we speak in the in the in the Atlantic, and they're running out of names. They're going into the Greek alphabet. I mean, soon they're going to go into the German alphabet or whatever alphabet. You know, uh, right. you know, we're 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 going to be going. It's just it's just unbelievable. And so it's my weird. point is, it's going up. It's going against the Coriolis effect. Usually they end up going, you know, north, you know, northwestward, you know, occasionally. And this one is actually formed off the coast of Africa and is basically turning and going back into Africa, which is oh, very, very <laughs> strange. Well, they can use the rain. They can use the rain. Yeah, exactly. Strange times. Um, but my point is, is that uh, in addition to the virus, in addition to the vaccine, in addition to the election, we still have the 900 pound gorilla in the room and that is climate change because with that, that is impacting everything. It's going to impact insurance rates, it's going to Im impact mortgages, it's going to impact where people are going to want to live and, and how they're going to want to live. And then ultimately the fires, the same thing, are going to impact, uh, you know, where we're going to grow our, our marijuana, where we're going to grow our fruits and vegetables, uh, you know, and, and so these malls may be, may be re repositioned. Let, let's talk a little bit about residential real estate, Ken, I mean, I'll talk about this. We've seen, uh, uh, you know, an increase in prices year over year. Uh, we're seeing cities like New York, where the prices have now stabilized. Uh, at least it isn't a free fall anymore, but we are still seeing folks from all over the, the north coming south, coming into the Sun Belt, coming to low tax states like, like Florida, uh, but focusing again more on homes and houses than condominiums. What's, what's your thought on that? Yeah, it, it, it basically it's a drive towards uh, uh, de-intensification of their living environments. Nobody wants to be on top of it, anybody. You know, I think from one perspective, the pandemic kind of helped the single family home market. Um, you know, there was a societal kind of push away from it. And it goes back to uh, the millennials that were, they want to live in cities. They, they're highly transient because of jobs. Now we know they can work wherever they want to work, whether it's Nebraska or Wyoming or, or Idaho, it doesn't matter chances are if they have a knowledge worker type role, they can work from anywhere. With that said, South Florida and the state of Florida in general is getting the benefit of having no state income tax. It's generally easier to live here and less expensive than other places around the country. And you know, if you look at the I-4 corridor up in, in every time I drive up there, which is you know every few months, 
there's another building, another tower, another hotel. It, it's stunning to see the amount of capital being extended there, also in the Tampa St. Pete area. So if we get a thousand people a day, and that's a real number, we're probably getting 25 to 30% of them down here, which means people ultimately, not all of them are entrepreneurs, but a lot of them are, they need a place to work and they need a place to live. So I think that the lack, we have a unique situation. We're not like LA or, you know, where you can continue to push to the East or Dallas, Fort Worth. We're constrained between the Everglades and the ocean. Unfortunately, with sea level rise, the, you know, the jury is kind of still out whether we're going to have a real problem and need to have seawalls and, and, and whether the water is going to come underneath our limestead, limestone porous you know, base that the state is made out of. It's, it, it's up in the air. I live in Weston and I've, I've never seen flooding like I've seen in, in the last couple of days. Now we did get two feet of water, which is unusual. But with climate change, they forecast that it's going to be more regular events. So I think that our housing market is going to do much better. The demand pattern is there for it. But we'll probably have sort of a, a limiting factor if we, we continue to have, you know, heavy rain and wind events. We'll have to see how that plays out. I want to run through some comments here, and then I, I, we're actually five minutes over our extension already, but let me just go over a few things. Uh, Evan Rosen, good friend, says, amen, guys, thanks for covering climate change. Yeah, well, it's a 900-pound gorilla in the room, just like, like everything else we're dealing with today. It is just, when you think about it, the number of issues that are impacting the economy, our lives, and real estate right now, it's, it's mind-numbing. And, that was, and as we were preparing for this, you know, it, we, we started off saying it was just the election. The election is only one manifestation of this. I mean, you, you have the virus, you have the vaccine, we have climate change, we have you know uh, social unrest. I mean, it's it, the number of issues that, that we're dealing with right right now are just are are, are just are just remarkable. Uh, we have. We I, have would add, I, I would add one point to that. What's interesting about climate change and real estate is the overall lack of 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 real concern as far as the development pattern here in South Florida and. There seems to be a lack of concern regarding the insurance market. Sooner or later, the insurance companies are going to say, I'm not going to uh, provide a, a policy on a coastal house in a flood zone. Right. Or that, that's gonna be, they're right, not going to provide be. one in, you know, in Santa Rosa, California. I've got a good friend who's building a house in Santa Rosa, in Coffee Park. It, you know, The whole neighborhood was destroyed. He bought a, a piece of land. He's building a house there right now. He's like, I can still get insurance. I said, good. I said, make sure you read that policy because, you know, hard to say whether you're going to get it next year. Uh, you know, six years ago, I remember I was interviewed on an NPR uh, program about climate change. And I said, and just like you're saying, the canary in the mine will be that insurance company that says, I am not insuring this property. Uh -oh. And when that happens, I've frozen. Yeah, you froze. Or maybe I froze, but I'll keep talking. Uh, and and so it would be first the insurance company and then the mortgage companies that say we will not provide a 30-year loan. They will provide a one-year loan, a five-year loan, but they're not going to provide a 30-year mortgage on some property that, that could be underwater in 20 years. And a lot of things that are going to have to, oh, you're back, Roy. We're, we're talking about minimum wage and how that might affect uh, the economy. Uh, hang on, we're we, we, uh, reading audio. Can you hear me? Am I good? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yep. I mean, so I, I'll just repeat myself. I mean, once mortgages, once insurance companies and mortgages stop uh, insuring, that that's when we're going to have a problem, you know. And then, and, it may, and eventually, it won't be a thirty-year loan. They'll say, "We'll give you a twenty-year loan. We'll give you a ten-year loan," and and that's when you know it's going to be be too late. And uh, there have been some studies already that are suggesting that areas like uh, Sunny Isles that the values are declining only because of climate change, subtly, subtly going down over the last six. I mean, beach. Miami Beach is down 7% due to sea level concerns, sea level rise concerns. That okay. is a real number. Okay. Well, that is a real number. And, and so, but no, it's, it's, it's again, something that people aren't willing to, to acknowledge. Uh, Ken, someone asked here, what does Ken think of commercial real estate? If the vaccine works, will remote working remain and office buildings continue to convert to something else? Our traditional office space is a thing of the past. So, so what will happen to excess office space? That's the bottom line. There will be excess office space. What will happen to it? Yeah, some of it's going to have to be repurposed. Like I said before, I think that genie's out of the bottle. I think getting people to come back in, uh, yes, uh, and there was a concern about, uh, and there is an ongoing concern about productivity. All I can say is my people are just as productive working from home or working from anywhere 
than they are if I make them come into the office. Uh, you will get, if you put 10 people on a panel, five will say yes to that and five will say hell no. It really depends on the industry. I do believe though, the cost of, of cooling and heating a secondary workspace uh, beyond, uh, uh, you know, when you don't have to go in and you can still stay in, in your own house or go to Starbucks or wherever, companies are going to, and, and are big and small, are going to do everything they can to save money. Th that cat is out of the bag. Now that we know from a forced experiment that it works, I, it's just nat it, it's just human nature. We're going to do what we can to save money. And I think, like I said, there's millions of square feet of functionally obsolescent office space that, you know, needs a lot of money to be spent and you'll never recapture that CapEx dollars to make them, to bring them up to speed to what, what is needed today. So, so they will either be demoed or, or repurposed. Yeah, but just speculate, what would the repurposing be? Hotels, I would, apartments? I would say, I would say a multifamily. That's probably about it. But again, from a structural standpoint, many office buildings have fixed pane glass that, you know, that would have, I mean, the whole curtain wall system would have to be changed. You'd have to, it'd have to be fully sprinkled and plumbed. I mean, the capital expenditure component of it is going to be so large to make it fit and meet code that probably hitting a, you know, just, you know, demolishing it might actually make better sense because the land value might have greater value than the actual but, you know, We've seen in New York, we've seen in Pittsburgh, we've seen in Brooklyn where you take these old factories and you convert them into living lofts and, 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 and artist lofts and other environments that, that are very popular. And you see that in Berlin and other places. So, so cities, you know, have this ability to re, re, reinvent themselves and rejuvenate. So it's going to be an interesting, it's going to be very interesting. Jerry uh, has, a, has, a, has a question here. With CPI and PCE running in the context of 1.4% annually, there's no reason for insurance premiums and property tax amounts to increase in excess of 5% to 10% annually. I would say that's right, except the claims have been enormous. The fire claims have been enormous. The flood claims are out of control. The claims are running way above average nationally, and that is the issue. And that, and that while the insurance companies remain solvent and have a ton of money, they need to make sure they remain solvent and continue to pay a dividend to their investors. Otherwise, their investors will flee and, and they won't have a company. So uh, they are going, going to continue to to increase on, on unfortunately. I'll tell you one short story and then we, we can have final remarks here, is that uh, there is a very large bank that spent over a billion and a half dollars in New York City to redo all their all their uni, all, all their offices. Only 20% of the people are showing up, even less. Their insurance company said, if not more than 25% of the people start using the building, you're going to lose your insurance. Don't ask me why, don't understand it. So they're now giving away their space for free the not-for-profit organizations who are willing to come in and temporarily use the space to bring the occupancy levels up. I mean, talk about insanity. I mean, just insanity. But that's that's where we are now. Ken? Well, insurance companies are not in the business to pay claims. Let's understand each other. I mean, that's not their business. Their business is to take you know, premiums, but not pay claims. And I think we all have to understand that. As much as you think that you've got insurance, really think very hardly about who your carrier is. Whenever I uh, bid out insurance, not only for my own residence, but my, my client's properties, I wanna know who the insurer is. I wanna know what their best rating is. I wanna know what their claim history is. And we all have to understand we're in a, it's just a different, different world now. Fires like we've seen out West are not gonna stop. Hurricanes and wind events that we're seeing here and on you know, the Gulf Coast and the East Coast, they're not going to stop. This is the new normal. I think you have to factor that in. If you're going to go buy an asset, whether it's a residence or an apartment or an office building or a warehouse, you really have to factor in climate change into that decision making. And that's the advice that I'm giving my clients. I want to just thank everyone again for joining us today. We'll, we'll probably do one more Zoom at noon before the end of the year. If there's some major events that occur, uh, that, that requires some commentary and input from all of us. We will be doing that. Obviously, uh, it, it's our honor to uh, have you uh, sit with us and share with us uh, your experiences. And Ken, as always, I want to thank you and thank everyone for, for Zooming with us at, at noon for our 30th time. 
And uh, may you all have a great Thanksgiving if I don't speak to you before. And we look forward to touching base before, before the new year. Godspeed.